our reality may be but one of virtually infinite versions out there in the multiverse, where anything which can happen will happen, which means if it is possible to travel to other parts of the multiverse, someone is bound to invade eventually, over and over and over again. Some months back we were discussing what current theory and physics told us about how wars fought across time might happen, and about time travel paradoxes in general, and there were a lot of requests for a follow up discussing how wars between universes in a multiverse might work. Since this weekend has the release of Quantum Mania, the newest Ant-Man and MCU film, and the big bad is supposed to be Kang the Conqueror, my second favorite comic villain after Doctor Doom, whose stick is multiverse and temporal wars, it seemed a great place to begin that conversation, along with talking about some of the different ways quantum mechanics seeks to explain alternate universes and timelines, and some of the confusion and hype that often comes with quantum, especially in science fiction and comics. We'll try to end the day with a better understanding of how quantum works, without resorting to lots of math, confusing examples, or wrecking some great sci-fi stories just because their science is iffy. Now speaking of that, while we will discuss Kang and other fictional examples today, and we'll actually discuss how you might fight wars across the multiverse, I want to emphasize this isn't an episode on him or the new film, which I haven't seen prior to writing the script for today's episode. Like a lot of our episodes, the science fiction examples are just the vehicle we use to explain science while having some fun. I'm probably making the title just a touch clickbait to include quantum media in it, but I couldn't resist considering how often folks in physics feel quantum gets crazily distorted to mumbo jumbo for stories or even philosophies. I do love my Marvel Comics examples though. I got hooked on both Batman the Animated Series and X-Men in the early 90s, but started buying Marvel comics rather than DC, and found the breadth of the universe and lore they are irresistible, particularly the really epic villains like Doom, Kang, Apocalypse, Thanos, and so on. Even as a young teen then I was already finding myself saying hey, wait a minute, at a lot of bad science, but more about how some technology or superpower just never got used in some really obvious and beneficial fashion or did but got forgotten and never used in future stories, and how that should impact the way a civilization would unfold if it had them. Let's take an example. If your basic mini wars hypothesis for quantum were true, then we have a near infinite number of alternate universes out there. This ought to include trillions upon trillions of replicas of our own Earth that is the same or close enough to our world, only humans never evolved there. Maybe the first primate who was borderline human didn't get born, or died off without having kids, or that first tribe died out from a plague or a meteor landing on them. Maybe life just started a little later on in that version of Earth, or maybe it is just a slightly younger universe. It doesn't matter at the moment, just that many of these wars without humans, but otherwise already hospitable to human life, exist, and if it was easy to find them in the other universe then presumably we could reach them by some portal. That means trillions and trillions of new planets we could step through a portal and claim. That seems a lot easier than trying to cross the endless void of space to reach those planets around the billions and billions of stars in our cosmos. A consequence of that is that you might never bother trying to colonize the galaxy because you have vastly more and more easily reached worlds right in your backyard. Why turn all your civilization industry to colonizing deep space in order to reach planets that are probably more barren than any desert or tundra on Earth when you could just step to a new paradise? It would be like living on an endless fertile river delta, which you could just travel a bit further down to find new land to cultivate, but opting to try to journey to and colonize the South Pole instead for some reason. One of our favorite topics on this show is the Fermi Paradox the big problem of where all the aliens are in such an ancient and immense universe, and this is an example of a solution that works better than most. Nobody colonizes or invades other parts of the galaxy because there's so much free and easy space in the multiverse. However we need to consider the consequences of something like that too, because a civilization that has access to a million linked copies of Earth also has insane amounts of resources to throw at space colonization or towards building giant beacons to say hello to aliens, 
which they might feel safer doing considering how easy it is for those other civilizations to colonize their own empty clones rather than trying to invade your world. On the other hand, there should be multiverse copies of Earth that are full of aliens, places where evolution went way differently or even where Earth's formation did. Remember there's a hypothetical Earth whose mass is just one atom less than ours, or one more, or as little as Mars, or was a second Jupiter, and everywhere in between and more. So you presumably have planets as alien as anything in this universe that are Earth clones in the multiverse. Another aspect of this is there's also presumably plenty of copies of Earth inhabited by humans, versions of you that just won the lottery or slightly more primitive planets where Earth is still back in the Stone Age, building pyramids or where technology progressed a bit faster and they're centuries ahead of us. The same applies if one isn't in a mini-world setting, but merely one where every act of time travel spawns a new timeline. And this is where Kang the Conqueror and other fictional cases emerge. There is that obvious temptation for whoever first gets their hands on multiverse or time travel technology to grab a list of winning lottery numbers or stocks and get rich in a new timeline, or get diagrams for great technologies of the 1960s and 70s and travel back and invent them and get rich and famous in, say, 1963 or to travel back with some technology and take over a primitive civilization who would see you as a godlike ruler. Indeed Kang first appeared in comics back in 1963 as a time traveler who took over ancient Egypt as the fictional pharaoh Rama Tut before being defeated by the Fantastic Four, and as one of their early and original villains. His background has shifted over the years but he appears again in 1964 under the name Kang, fighting the Avengers and he's had a lot of different identities and characterizations over the years. Typically if some story is considered bad, it can later be retconned as having been a different Kang from a different timeline or multiverse. We see something similar with Doctor Doom, both with time travel and whose armored visage and mastery of robotics lets him make copies of himself called Doombots, on which bad plot lines are retroactively blamed. And depending on the era, Kang is either a descendant of Doom or Reed Richards or both and stole his time travel tech from Doom. This also raises the possibility of accidentally ending up as your own grandfather and grandson, or being the architect of your own future problems, and Kang's stories frequently follow that approach. He ends up fighting himself, often literally when discussing multiverses. But what science, if any, is all this based off of? First, we need to understand that there are a bunch of different multiverse scenarios, and we detailed a lot of those options in our episode on multiverses and parallel realities, but the two which folks are most familiar with are time travel version and the quantum version. They are not the only ones and they also get mixed up with each other a lot, plus, rather appropriately, they have a lot of parallel versions too. Multiverses can range from simple versions like a bunch of physically neighboring universes who all popped out during their own big bangs and eventually overlap each other, to cycling versions of the universe, big bang to big crunch or big rip, regenerating and spawning a new version of the universe. Indeed that's the origin story of another classic Fantastic Four villain, Galactus, Eater of Worlds, who is left over from a prior iteration of the universe and also the Five Mile Tall Celestials from the Eternals. That's another time travel and multiverse option, you just jump into an older or younger universe, rather than earlier or later in your own. We also have this option in simulated universes, where a civilization is actually inside a computer or some godlike entity's creation or dream, and basically, you can revert to your last save state or play multiple different outcomes from some earlier shared save point. And these ideas often predate quantum mechanics, indeed the term multiverse does too, first appearing in 1895 in an unrelated usage by William James to essentially discuss the notion of if all of our new and conflicting notions of the universe and philosophy at the time made nature plastic and indifferent, a moral multiverse as he called it, rather than a moral universe. Coincidentally the same year, Boltzmann and Zomelio were having their debates about thermodynamics and entropy, the idea of a statistical universe in which every atom's state and position is changing around like shuffling cards, 
If you shuffle a deck enough times, eventually it will return to a previous state. Do not try this at home, it would take you and many multiverse copies of you several lifetimes of all day shuffling for that to become a probable outcome, but over a long enough time it will happen, essentially restoring a previous moment of time from which events may once again unfold. By the same reasoning, in an infinitely long lasting static universe, which is what they thought our universe was at the end of the 19th century, even though entropy would run everything down to a universe of random particle fluctuations in a distant future, in an even more distant future those random fluctuations should return to some prior ordered state. This is called Poincare Recurrence, for Henry Poincare who suggested it back in 1890 for closed systems like cards. As a trivial example, if you roll a pair of dice and get a 2 and a 4, that is a specific state and one that has a 1 in 36 chance of rolling, so every few dozen rolls it would not be surprising for that to repeat, and essentially reset that very simple system of just two particles with each having six states they can be in. If we increase that to just 20 dice, the number of possible combinations would be 3 quadrillion, 656 trillion, 158 billion, 440 million, 62,976. Any non microscopic object has trillions of particles it is composed of, though, not 2 or 20. But it begins to illustrate how huge these numbers get. It is also where we get the notion of a Boltzmann brain as in his debates a few years later about this concept applied at the cosmic scale, Boltzmann suggested a completely functional brain might be able to assemble at random, rather than through evolution. You can probably see how a lot of these ideas are high octane fuel for story vehicles. A few decades later though we would develop our basic knowledge of quantum mechanics, and that began by realizing that certain particles simply decayed into other particles occasionally and with no known cause, merely that while that decay might happen at any point with a single particle, seemingly at random, much like a coin flip, if you had tons of the same particle together, the statistical nature of that group made for incredibly predictable rates of decay, so much so that we use them in some of our most accurate clocks. The field of quantum, which has now turned into something of a synonym for arcane and confusing, gets its name from the rather mundane word quanta, as in quantity, and the notion that to our surprise, we were finding that there were minimum discrete values for things in the universe. We found a charged particle called an electron, and seemed to only come in one type with one specific charge. There is no electron with 10% more mass or 9% less charge. There is no proton that's just a little heavier than a neutron, or has half the charge or 99% normal charge. Things are very specific and discrete like our basic English alphabet of 26 specific characters with specific properties we combine to make words from, and not like real numbers in math, which can be infinitely divided up ever smaller. There is a place between 1 and 2, 2 and 3, for numbers like 1.5 or 2 and a quarter. There is no A and a half, or D and a third of an E. Letters are discrete, and subatomic particles appear to be too. That the world was discrete was a bit of a surprising thing, as was the apparent randomness of particle decay and the uncertainty principle, which held that you could only know the position and momentum of an object to a certain combined accuracy. Beyond that, if you measured something's position more accurately, its momentum became less certain, and vice versa. The same was true with energy and time, and some other linked quantities. The mechanics of how these quanta interact and how they behave became quantum mechanics. This was all very weird, and yet, test after test, many from totally unrelated types of experiments kept confirming all these results. Explanations were suggested but even to this day, not a single one has any significant proof it is true or more likely than any of the suggested options. The two big ones are Copenhagen Interpretation, which you know from Schrodinger's cat, and Mini Ward's interpretation, or MWI. Copenhagen is straightforward, there may be other universes like other books on a shelf, but they're not linked by events. There's only one in which the events you're seeing are happening, 
but at the quantum scale, events are happening simultaneously until observation forces only one event to be true. This is not that arcane, it's just saying that if I've got a closed and soundproof box with a cat inside it, that cat might be up to any number of things, but I do not know which till I open it. That is very normal and understandable. The weird part is that Copenhagen Interpretation is assuming any of the possible true outcomes are simultaneously happening in a hazy mixed state called superposition until someone opens that box, at which time one of those realities locks in and the others disappear as though they've never been. We did not know what happened in the box till we opened it, but to our surprise, it wasn't our ignorance of what thing was happening that we couldn't see but rather that all things were actually happening till we opened it. That is the weird part. That sounds suspiciously like someone is making a decision about which reality has actually happened, and gets even weirder because we might place the observer in a room with a closed door. Now a person outside that room doesn't know what's happening in that box even after our first observer opens it, not till the door to that room gets opened and lets us know. We don't really know which observer gets primacy there. Is it the first and nearest observer for instance? Is an observer 10 light years away going to trump some prior observation when 10 years later the light of that event reaches them? And does that mean everything is still in a haze of possibilities all the way out to the cosmological event horizon billions of light years away? Are those places beyond the cosmological event horizon different universes? Does an observer need to have a mind at all? or just be an event of determination, like whatever action your experiment took to let you measure that particle? Is there an hierarchy on determination by observers, such that something godlike has final say on the state of things? Abraham Pays writes an account of him and Albert Einstein talking about quantum while on a walk together, and Einstein suddenly stopped, turning to him, and asked if he really believed the moon only exists when he looks at it. The Copenhagen interpretation of the 1920s was generally considered a correct physical theory, as it predicted outcomes of quantum events with amazing precision, but could not be considered a complete theory because of these sorts of conundrums and paradoxes, along with the feeling that Copenhagen interpretation is saying that what cannot be observed does not exist, which to many just feels wrong even if true in a practical sense. If we cannot relate to or observe or interact with something, it really doesn't matter if it exists or not, and you can never prove it does. And perhaps more irritating is that if you're trying to determine an experiment that would determine who determines things, which observer counts or if you need an observer, you have the critical problem that you cannot create an experiment in which you are not an observer. Even someone else running the experiment and giving you the results is still an experiment ending with you reading those results and observing them. Everything is under the shadow of your observation as you can only know what you can know. Again, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics says there is just one reality, but it can be rather hazy at moments. Indeed it is always just a little hazy and undetermined when you zoom in real close to look at tiny bits of matter or energy, or tiny distances or tiny moments of time, the quantum realm, and this is all assumed to be genuinely random inside certain rules. At a macroscopic scale, all this quantum activity is very tight and clear, much as if you flip billions and billions of coins, you still end up with 50% heads and 50% tails. Even if you had heads come up a thousand times more than tails, because 500 million 1,000 heads and 499 million 999,000 tails is still 50.0001% heads and 49.999% tails, and we are not made of a billion atoms but far more. Indeed, most of the cells in your body, of which we have billions, are themselves made up of many billions of atoms, which can be in a lot more states or positions than heads or tails. So by default, any random quantum event is affecting reality no more than if one more drop of rain fell on a forest during a downpour. That of course is the point of the butterfly effect too or the Schrodinger's cat experiment where a vial of poison is being released in the box by a trigger sensitive to the decay of a single radioactive particle, 
and if you're curious we can build such devices that are sensitive to a single particle or photon. We could use it to choose between two options, like what to have for lunch, some chicken nuggets or a cheeseburger, and the results should be unpredictable, which is one way to avoid precognitive tricks of superintelligent entities or mega computers trying to guess your actions. So even some very tiny event can and does alter the future depending on when and how it happens, as we explored in both our butterfly effect and our examination of the quantum cheeseburger and infinite improbability issues. This is critical to discussing multiverses in the alternate timeline sense, but not the many worlds interpretation of quantum that came in the 1950s, a couple decades after the Copenhagen interpretation. In this interpretation, it is not necessarily that every quantum event with two or more outcomes creates a new universe for each outcome, but rather that all possible positions in which particles can be arranged exist and your measurement is just acknowledging which one you are in. Like every possible combination of a million letters has been arranged into various books, each a few hundred pages long, and you don't know which actual book you are in. And that is a lot of books. That's only arranging a few dozen characters into a million different positions. That's every book ever written, plus a lot of babble written by a finite number of monkeys, not even the complexity of options of a single microscopic cell, let alone a human, let alone a planet, and each of those scales adds exponentially more options, though there's still a finite number of them. The number of possible arrangements involved in a multiverse of this type, and again there are other versions, or the alternate timelines variety for that matter, is so big that actually saying it would serve no purpose. It is not a trillion or a trillion trillion, it's not even a one followed by a million zeros or a number that could fill a whole book, it's the sort of scale where just the paper needed to hold the numerical code for just one multiverse might require whole libraries, and an actual library of those codes, multiverse addresses or phone numbers, even in digital format, would collapse under its own mass into a black hole. Indeed if you did make an immense library of classic phone books holding those addresses, immune to gravity somehow, you would not have enough atoms in our whole universe to print them or build the shelves they sat on. This version does assume every state already exists and bypasses the issue of universes dividing like amoeba every new moment in time and place in space though that too is an option on the table. And while people might wonder where the energy to constantly make all those new universes is coming from, the answer is probably the same place the universe got that energy from in the first place, at the Big Bang, and of course we don't know yet. But the problem of where you got it from mysteriously one time, or a gajillion times, isn't really a different problem. So let's talk about how you could fight a war on that scale, and if you could even do so. First, I'm not a big believer in time travel or multiverse theory, be it many worlds or its parallels on a string theory or some other variants. I'm not alone in that, very few physicists are loud advocates for either Copenhagen or MWI and there are contradictory options too, you don't have both being true at once, even if that would be rather appropriately amusing as an analogy for Schrodinger's simultaneously alive and dead cat all the quantum theories being simultaneously true until one is proven right. Most of us view the interpretations as currently untestable and possibly forever, and have one we tilt to mostly as a matter of preference rather than science, though I suspect interpretation we dislike least is probably more apt than version we actually like. If you're looking for more on the philosophical problems with proving quantum interpretations or the philosophical repercussions of it, plenty have been written on the topic, including a lot of gobbledygook. Which I'm sad to say is not just from non-scientists misinterpreting science, but often from scientists who just don't bother learning any philosophy. I'd recommend Karl Popper and his criticisms of Copenhagen as a good place to start reading on the topic. He's also great for understanding the core concept of proof and falsifiability in science, and he would probably take issue with my earlier comments about how there are no protons with 99% of normal charge since I haven't checked every single proton in the universe to be sure that's true. 
In my not very humble opinion, Popper is one of if not the best philosophers of the last century, second only maybe to Rudolf Carnap. Now in order to conquer or colonize other multiverses you need some way to get there, and that's easy enough in the case of alternate timelines made by time travel, as you can't just travel back in time and make your change and live in that timeline and use that same time machine again if you need a new one. Obviously you need a time machine to do this, but that's a whole different topic and one we've covered before. Here the notion is usually that you're fighting with people because they try to alter your past and wipe you out. How you persist to exist and seek revenge is hand-waved. If I jump back in time to become King Arthur in the year 500 AD and this makes you cease to exist, you cannot go back to fight me. And if I didn't make you cease to exist, then you don't have a motivation to be angry. Your universe is fine, I just made a new one, practically speaking. For story purposes we can imagine a thingamajig that protects you locally from the disturbance, in which case that should be able to be made bigger to cover your whole world, but we also might justify that under Copenhagen as something like the force that keeps Schrodinger's various alternate living and dead cats from merging together inside that unopened box. It keeps the box or your bit of reality from falling in on itself and being absorbed, and you might need a stronger truss the bigger your box is, to support the lid or the more you're protecting, or the longer you're protecting it for, so we'll call this type of device a Quantum Absorption Truss, or QAT or CAT for short. Presumably all those times in which this or that time traveler has a wristband on, preventing them from ceasing to exist while fixing the past, like Bishop or Cable or Wolverine in various days of future past stories, they are wearing a cat, and we see similar cat space in Eternity in Isaac Asimov's classic time travel story The End of Eternity or the Ward of Gallifrey in Doctor Who, where all the Time Lords live. It is also not that hard to imagine the various timelines like to braid together and do not just keep forking over and over like a tree, but tend to stick to a fairly tight cable with frayed bits too far off the norm for the universe to fall off. Sounds cool, but I know of no science supporting such a notion or the idea of temporal inertia, where things are prone to converging back together over long times. You could argue that changes to the timeline just get absorbed over very long stretches, and while I don't see a strong physical argument for that, it is specifically true in a steady state universe with Poincare recurrence, which we discussed a few minutes ago, insanely long lengths of time where random resets occur, but this is far longer than people would usually mean for a change in the timeline getting absorbed. Beyond this we don't really have any new problems or motivations for alternate timeline invasion. As we mentioned in our Time Wars episode though, if you do have far more future universes than past ones, because universes divide like amoeba at every new moment in time and place in space, you could easily get folks invading back in time in such numbers that they destroyed their world by simply adding so much mass that it turned into a black hole. Presumably every new timeline that gets created eventually has someone who wants to go back to the same time and you can just cram the place. The same applies for mini world style invasions but only kind of. If I can make a portal to a clone universe, one the same except some of the atoms are not quite in the same position, then how many copies there are should change the moment I and my trillions of trillions of atoms step through, and presumably decrease if I step back through carrying a bunch of gold nuggets from some riverbed in California in 1849. If every possible universe which can exist does exist, then I can take all that gold or diamonds in the rough from Namibia and go buy tons of weapons from some super advanced weapon shop on Earth 2099 or 928. I can then use them to set up shop on some ward as a conqueror, or go fight and kill another iteration of myself, or someone else I dislike, but there's still a near infinite number of other wards with that person still on them, and arguably more now that I traveled to fight one, adding my atoms and their positions to the mix, including ones where he beat me. You cannot colonize all those Earth clones that are just missing people because you just spawn more of them by going. In one version you step through and change your mind and leave a second later. 
Free will is a difficult concept in multiverse theories of this type. Also, if we're not adding mass and additional states that could exist when we travel to new multiverses, instead just changing information, like if we transform some pre-existing rock or air into you, switching the atoms around but not adding new ones, then it is rather debatable if two identical copies of you, both traveling to the same clone Earth at the exact place and same moment, would even result in two of you there, or just one more merged identical reality, or if it would matter. The whole notion is philosophically tricky, and to me travel between multiverses almost necessitates a higher layer of reality too, which is a theme explored in one of my favorite books, The Hand of Oberon. In our Traveler's case, you both came in and added the identical edit to the universe of that book, and that million character long book can have more added to it, you add another person or another sentence so it's a million and twenty characters long. There was endless trillions of new combinations right there, and it still doesn't stop us from adding or removing more sentences, but it does imply the existence of a library and editing table for that book, and if you and I both add the identical sentence to two different copies of the same book, did we really change that book twice? And if there was some sort of prime reality, one that mattered more, a higher layer for instance, like we see with Amber and its reflections and shadows in Rogers Lasley's Amber series, then presumably there's a near infinite number of lesser realities where the ability to travel to that prime reality was gained, and where they also chose to invade. This results in the same crazy notion I mentioned a moment ago, where the infinite armadas and legions marching onto this world from all of its branches crushes it under rising geological layers of dead bodies and wrecked war machines until it collapses into a singularity. It makes travel between multiverses feel rather nihilistic and self-defeating, something explored a lot with portal travel in the show Rick and Morty and makes an interesting Fermi Paradox multiverse case we examined in more detail, where we wonder why we don't see alien visitors or conquerors from other multiverses. It might be that most universes do get that visit, but of course some don't and we might be in one of those, or it might be that it proves such travel is impossible, since otherwise we should see it all the time, just like time travel. If it ever gets invented, it should result in people traveling to the past, including the here and now. The existence of many worlds, if that interpretation of quantum is right, does not imply travel between them is possible, incidentally. It doesn't suggest either way. However, even if such travel is impossible, if there is a universe for every possible state every atom might be in, then there already is one where some combination of atoms otherwise identical to our 6th century England had assembled into a Boltzmann brain complete with a body and fake memories of some guy named Isaac Arthur from the 24th century. So a portal to such a multiverse I could go to might not even be a transport, it might just happen to be that one specific universe where that Boltzmann brain existed. Indeed there would be tons of them, if many words is correct, there are uncountable versions of our 6th century AD where by freak chance some dude named Isaac Arthur or some dude named Merlin or the Doctor just popped into existence complete with fake memories of being a traveler from the future. There is also one where just one irrelevant atom in my toe is not in the same place as normal, there is another one where an atom in my thumb is and another reality for where just one extra atom of iron was in our planet's core, or on Pluto but in a different spot. There are even realities where the whole universe is full of random lifeless rocks except for a giant citadel on which thousands of Boltzmann brains named Isaac or Rick or Reed all serve on a council and think they're from different universes and can travel through space and time and reality. There's another where it's the same but with one more person, one less, or even where the vending machine with soda on the third floor has just one less can in it, or just as many cans but one less molecule of sugar in it. So too there's one where a purple skinned guys named Nathaniel or Rama or Immortus or Kang have teamed up to make a council, or believe they are fighting wars with each other. There's one where a guy popped into existence holding a gun that he thinks makes portals to new worlds that he invented and which actually just vaporizes him. 
and his random memory includes his century-long battle against his evil alternate reality twins for control of reality. There's also one where he believes that and that his name is Susan or Reed instead. There's also a bunch of universes where the Boltzmann brain that assembled thinks it owns a chocolate factory operated by a bunch of Oompa Loompas and indeed one where they really exist and one where they do but manufacture a highly addictive soda instead of chocolate. And there are countless more realities where no Boltzmann brains exist anywhere, or where one that does is not human or superhuman but barely as smart as a slug. That is the reality of near-infinite realities. If many worlds exist, they are people who firmly believe they travel them and are able to provide evidence they do regardless of whether it is possible or not. There is a universe full of disintegration portals people keep walking into which by freak coincidence keep sending back coherent and believable messages to mission control for centuries of operation. This is the craziness of numbers or permutations so big they would collapse into black holes if they were written out, quantum mania. Such realities are insanely unlikely and yet the number of possible universes is so much insanely bigger that there are almost countless realities where the seemingly impossible appears to be happening, not because the rules have changed but because every so often an infinite number of monkeys banging away crazily at a keyboard can type a coherent sentence out, and even more rarely, a whole script. So yes, if many words is true, somewhere out there is a man who thinks he can change size all the way down to something smaller than an ant, and a girl who can too, and a purple skinned person who thinks he can conquer every reality. It seems like every time I pop onto Facebook one of my friends is either posting about getting hacked or mysteriously messaging me hacked content and one of the big culprits is people using the same password everywhere and then some low security website they have an account on gets hacked along with their email and their password that they use for everything. The best way to avoid this is to turn two-factor authentication on and get a password manager like NordPass so you're securely using different passwords everywhere but don't have to try to memorize them all or write them down on post-it notes. With NordPass you can quickly and easily generate ultra-secure passwords, store them, and change them, all while being able to take advantage of features like autofill so you can shop and browse faster online and keep your credit cards and payment details securely at your fingertips and on up to six different devices. They can also let you know if your passwords are weak or getting reused or old, and the data breach scanner can alert you when leaks happen on websites that might have compromised your data and does all of this as a zero-knowledge password manager, meaning your data is safe even from NordPass because they can't get at it either. To get exclusive access to NordPass's best offer, go to nordpass.com slash IsaacNordPass and use code IsaacNordPass at the checkout to get one additional month for free, again that's nordpass.com slash IsaacNordPass and use code IsaacNordPass. I want to give a quick shout out to Comics Explained for all their Kang videos amongst other ones as it was a great and entertaining refresher and a deep dive on the character before writing this episode. Thanks Rob for all the endless hours of entertainment too. Speaking of hours of informative entertainment, next Thursday we'll take a journey to Alpha Centauri and ask what our options are for making that voyage. And the weekend after that we'll have our end of the month livestream Q&A, Sunday, February 26 at 4pm Eastern Time, where my lovely wife and co-host Sarah will take your questions live from the chat for me to answer. I hope to see you then. After that we'll start off March with one of my favorite topics, Space Habitats, on Thursday, March 2nd. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week!